Hello, everyone. Um, this is the seventh of a series of interviews called Apartan Together with Miki Kashtan as a response to coronavirus and what opportunities with all the pain came alongside of it, it might be bringing to us. The interviews are accompanying a series of articles Miki has been publishing with the same title on our website, thefearlessheart.org. So um, to begin with, Miki, um, in, in this piece, in this last piece, you are examining the impact of the pandemic in our homes, uh, family lives, where it is now joined by the work life. Millions of people all around the world are now working from home, and this is new to many, and it's full of challenges. So many of us would think that this is challenging because simply children need to go to school or work and family spaces should be separate from each other, of course. So it's hard for us to imagine that maybe it is challenging because our lives are structured in a way that is not in harmony with our biologic, social, emotional design as a species and also, and also with life itself. And schools and offices are, were not the first inventions of humankind. So I'm imagining maybe how we came to this point of sharp separation, maybe a good point of entry. Like, how did we separate children's learning from daily life with adults in community? Or how did we separate production from uh, being a home or community centered activity of life? And of course, I'm also curious about the impacts, what kind of impacts all these brought to children, adults and communities, but I'm guessing maybe there will be questions about this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, this is like a huge question and you're asking it like it's a really small and simple question. It's really huge um, because what we're talking about is, exactly all the ways in which we have taken steps progressively to remove ourselves from life, from each other, from flow, um, from integration, from community, from interconnection, from all these things. And I'm also thinking about it, the word production itself is to produce and producing is in a way it's like I'm, I'm just thinking this freshly as I'm saying it's like taking what is there and changing it so there's something in there already that what is there is not enough I am I'm I think this relates to an earlier piece where I talked about consumption and, and how much we use and how much do we really need, which is more recent. But that's about quantity. Just the idea that what life gives is not enough and we need to change it and make something out of it is already quite an amazing um, distance that we have. Now, we're not going to go back. We're not going to be foragers again. That door is locked shut and the keys have been thrown into the depth of the ocean long ago. Not possible. But um, the, the questions can lead us in directions that might be new, which is at what point do we stop and say, this is collectively enough. Like, do we really need, um, do we really need to create a next generation iPhone? Or is the one that people are using already enough? And therefore, if enough are produced for all the people that are living, we don't need to produce anymore. We just need to fix and maintain the ones that exist. 
this is really a tiny inconsequential example, but it's a mindset, it's a mindset that keeps us collectively tethered to a machine of production. Um, and it has become more and more abstract and requiring more and more resources. So whatever needs to be produced cannot be produced any longer in a community setting or in a home setting. It can only be produced in some big place that people need to go to. So this, this is, you know, kind of like a way of explaining how did we actually have to exit home in order to go to the office or the factory or the store. It's not just offices, it's all the workplaces, hospitals, schools are also workplaces. Um, when we wake up, both adults and children, when we wake up, for most of us, before this pandemic, the thing to do is wake up, get ready, leave home. So home, especially now that so many families are two earner families, most families are two earner families. I don't know if most families, I don't know why I said that, but many families are two earner families. The home becomes um, a skeleton for many hours of every day because everybody is out of it. This is a bizarre notion. You, we put so much money and effort. We buy all this decoration. We pay all this mortgage for a place that we mostly sleep in. It's not where we live. It's where we, you know, house and shelter ourselves so that we can go back to work. We're not the ones usually who benefit from it. So this, this is a, um, a, a piece of it. And then you need to create a story that makes sense of it. So initially when in, uh, the world industrialized, everybody went to the factory in the lower classes. And I don't like the word lower classes. In the working classes, the impoverished classes, the exploited classes, everybody left home to go to the factory. And there was, massive disease and death. Um, I mean, the, this is well documented in many ways. If you read Dickens, it's a lot of it, you see echoes of that period. It, it's hard for a modern contemporary 21st century mind to grasp how horrid the conditions of the working class were when it was first formed. And subsequently, all of that changed, but the fundamental thing that how we create everything is through jobs, that's done. That learning happens in schools and not in life, that's done. Those of us who do something different are upstream against a society that pushes in a particular direction. So this is where the pandemic is disrupting all of that without actually disrupting it. It's disrupting it within itself, so it makes it intolerable to live as it is. But very rarely does it actually lead to people wanting to challenge the fundamental notions. Although, you know, a lot of people say they want to continue to work from home. A lot of people, more than half. But look at the difference between working from home and working at home. Working from home means still that the work is someplace else and you are connected to it to some kind of a screen. You're not actually making or doing anything at home. You are on a screen like we are now talking with people someplace else, having meetings, working on documents, all of this, you're not actually creating anything in your environment with the people near you, which is what production used to be. So we're not, we haven't actually changed the fundamental structure. We've just put pressure on it so it's cracking. And when it's cracking, we can see things. So I, I don't know if that's, enough or you have um, any follow-up 
it was just so big that I didn't know how to capture all of it. So if there's any part of it that you want to add, please. No, um, it just makes so much sense because, you know, that piece is really touching. You know, life is not enough. What we have is not enough so that we need to produce more so that and what we can produce at home is not going to be enough. So let's go out somewhere. And this is also where children are separated from from home. Yes. From learning from the elders, from adults, from older children. You know, the, the, in Israel, there's the kibbutz movement, which is pretty much dead, but it was very alive for several decades. And one of the things that the early, in the early years of the kibbutz they were doing is they collectivized everything, including children. So children were born and within days were put in children's homes by age and taken care of by people, mostly women, whose job it was to take care of the children. And the parents were coming for visiting hours to their children. And there are all these stories about little children, two, three year old, you know, in the middle of the night, escaping their children's home, running to their parents' home and being brought back by force because it wasn't supposed to be. So um, it was a, a major disruption of, um, of relationship. It was a, a collectivization that wasn't actually community-based. It, it was, in, in my mind, a very twisted idea, though, I can tell you, I have family in a kibbutz from a certain age on. It was amazing because there's this thing called a children's society. So that the children of a certain age, once they become conscious enough, will running, running their own affairs with far too few adults to really be able to control and discipline them. That was fun. That felt like freedom. But but uh, but it's freedom without relationship, which is the, the general nature of freedom in modern life. It's freedom means being outside relationship. So, um, and, and then there's also the thing about children being mostly with other children their same age, which also is not natural. Yeah. So I was looking at the Silvia Federici quote, um, cooperation at the point of production and separation and automation at the point of reproduction and seeing um, reproduction, like the, the point of reproduction as being the place of the, the home of, of mothering. And so it's in that place where separation and automation happens and then there was another quote that I thought of in relation to this which is a uh, Erika Shruba Makusa quote about how um, oppression takes place through the oppression of young people and so in a society where there's oppression all young people will be oppressed so it's like in that space where oppression is automated I'm just wondering what are some of the ways in which it's automated so that that is then replica replicable so that even though we come from a place of like gift and mothering, we, we, and we can enter into actually reproducing oppression. Yeah, I'm really loving how you're connecting these three streams of thought together. <laughs> it kind of uh, hits me right at my center because what it makes clear is that the, um, everyone becomes weak um, in, this, um, in this kind of environment. Um, because in a place where you're together with other people, your life is very regimented. Either in a factory or office or in school, your steps are, you know, 
watched. You're told what to do. You're supposed to do certain things. So you don't really have any kind of freedom or creativity in those environments. Or your creativity is channeled within what you are commanded to create. And then at home, um, you are separated from relationships. So the only capacity that is available is the capacity that exists within the single family, nuclear or not, but within one family without any real support from the surrounding. So both the parents and the children are weak. Weak, it all depends on their individual capacity because there isn't community holding. And that I'm, I'm always, when I say certain things, I look at you, Rina, because of you live in a society where there's so much more left still of uh, community-based things. So I'm, I'm eager to hear what emerges or what you're thinking about this. But what I am thinking now is when I am a child, and all I know is the particular family that I am brought up in, because that's the, the, only, the only place there isn't that community-based. And in her book, Silvia Federici describes communities in which impoverished communities around the world, I, I didn't put much of it into the article, in, in which women come together when they don't have enough. They are so impoverished that they don't have enough. They come together creatively. You know, they shop to get to collectively. They cook collectively. That gives them more resource and more capacity. And within that, I don't know enough. I haven't been enough in those situations to grasp the viscerality of how this happens. But I have a sense it creates more capacity to buffer the messages of oppression because you have different places to go. So it's almost like it's softer. It's not as sharp and pointed. When all you have is your own parents, everything they say is so potent. It's so powerful. You don't know how to, um, how to move away from it. So in that sense, that separation very much supports making, it's almost like making oppression uh, kind of like an assembly line. The next child and the next child and the next child. Okay, this is male. This goes into this kind of conditioning. Female goes into this kind of conditioning. White skin, this kind of conditioning. Brown skin, that kind of conditioning. All of it without anyone thinking that that's what they're doing. That is part of the horror, is that each parent is really thinking with as much creativity as they can bring into it about how to prepare their child for what life is going to be. And if, if you know that life is going to be harsh for your children and that for them to get a job, they need to learn to obey, you will hit them when they don't. So all of these things conspire so that our oppression comes within a context of love. So it's harder to resist as children. So that, that is what's coming to me. Do you have uh, more follow-up? What I'm getting from it is like, it's just, it's a pattern, so like there's a systemic pattern, like a, it's, it's a tessellation, it, we were born and then we're born into that shape and then it just repeats itself, that's essentially yes. what, what happens, that's how it's reproduced, um, it's, yeah, I, yeah, that's just how it's, that is, those are the mechanisms, mechanisms we could look in like many, many details at what the, the, the shape of that. Yes. That, yes. That, but that tessellates. It essentially just reproduces yeah. um, itself, which uh, 
yeah, separate, just an act to separate us from life. Um, that is the, yeah. the shape of it and the mechanism. So. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of like tie together some threads. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to ask <clears throat> something. So I, um, I, I, had my, um, I had a conversation, actually an argument with my father-in-law. And as I mentioned before, his wife just died. And he feels so powerless and impotent. And one of the reasons why I got really upset, because at one point he says, I now have to depend on people and I have to ask for help. And in my mind, I thought, yes. <laughs> and this was still, and I, I could not communicate my, my belief that this is so, and that this is something that we can embrace. And he was in such angst and despair that my trying to repeat the same thing only produced more angst and despair and I allowed it to go. And I thought to myself, and this is the generation that we come from, the one that was taught to be independent. So I turned around and had this conversation with my daughter, who's in my mind, the one who's forthcoming. And I'd asked her, uh, you know, what are your circles of support? Because, you know, your dad and I and our family fairly stretched thin with capacity. And what she heard was like, oh, so I can't count on you. Mm. And I kept on saying, no, it's just that sometimes you will want things from us that we cannot give you, not because we're not wanting, but because we just are stretched in capacity. And, and it was, it was a, a bittersweet sweet conversation because part of it is somehow she had also learned, like maybe I have passed on to her, that, okay, we're not alone, but we have to depend only on our family. And if our family is not available, then what happens? And, and the feeling of loss and the feeling like, well, then there's no one else. And, and this is the generation that's gone in my mind. Uh, okay, so I'm having this. And then there's this quote that you wrote uh, that I was holding, which you said, I have it here. Trust is to a collaboration-based social order what fear is to an authority-based social order. Trust then is the glue that binds everyone together in a large scale society or organization. Mm -hmm. And I realized she does not trust and my father-in-law does not trust. And then, so what do we do to build trust mm -hmm. when trust is so ephemeral with what has been disrupted mm -hmm. with COVID? So first I, I, I can't skip over one piece that you didn't name and I am wondering if you thought about it, which is the gender dimension of his angst. When yes. your mother-in-law was alive, he didn't have to ask anyone because he had his home-based support that he didn't have to ask anything from because it was her job as a woman yes. to care for him. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that he thinks that consciously, but that is how it operates. So there is a huge invisibility of the enormity of labor that women all over the world um, are doing to keep in place things, to keep in place things that are torn where the tear is growing and the labor of women is growing, but it's not becoming smaller in other places. So it's just growing and growing and growing. Um, yeah, you wanted to say something? I, I wanna, yes, I want to add that she, and this is very telling. So I do, I, it is gender, very much gender in his case, because he keeps on confusing the death of his mother with his wife's. So sometimes he'll say my mother and I'm thinking my mother, like the mother of your children or my mother as in my mother. And he will say, they left me, they left me. And um, yeah. yeah. So I, yes, thank you for, for, for giving clarity to that. Yes, um, this is, you know, I was talking, when I was talking with Emma, I was saying something about how the family is weak and you are giving shape to one of the things that makes the family weak, which is all of our emotional needs are supposed to be met within the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even as the family is separated from other families. And so the idea that we can have actual communities, networks of support where resources 
flow based on need and capacity. And where the more people are involved, there's always going to be someone with more capacity. I'm reminded of what a friend of mine told me about growing up in the projects in Cleveland, where everybody doesn't have enough. It's a given. And you kind of know who is in a particularly difficult situation and is not going to be able to pay the rent. And then you don't wait for that person to ask. The rest of the community, like, who happens to have a little bit of extra this month and you pull it together and you come to the person so that their dignity can be maintained and you say, here's for rent. That is that is the, the communal way of being because the same person that now gave to this person for rent in three months time, they may need it and everybody knows it. So there is a real tie of shared fortune. People who are closer to the bones know that they need each other know it in a way that is in the body. You don't need anybody to tell you that interconnection is a thing. You feel it. Again, I see Rena's face. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of us who grew in very, you know, hyper-modernized, hyper-individualized global North cultures, it's abstract. I remember a conversation that I had with some friends about 20 years ago, where they were adamant that they didn't have a need for community. They just didn't have that need. So um, I think this is again something, and uh, it's going to come up more in, in the next piece, where in a way the, the lockdowns are creating a caricature of modern isolated life. And it pushes the point of how isolation doesn't work. So, so then, then in the next one, I'm going to be talking about how we deal with our emotional life. And there is like massive increase in what are called mental health issues instead of seeing them as <clears throat> isolation symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yes. You said something that really resonated, that somehow we have absorbed the idea that freedom is freedom from relationships, as if relationships is something that will make us weaker and yeah. dependent on. So when you said the word dignity, it suddenly came to me, oh, I mean, my definition of dignity, it's I, I, I am human and I trust that I matter. So it's yeah. tied to trust. It's tied yeah. to my humaneness. And how would I know I matter if I don't matter with others? Like, yeah, so that's the piece. That yeah, I, I, trust. yeah, I want to come back to the, to the piece about trust. It's, it's one of the big questions of, is it possible still to create change um, when mistrust and fear are so deeply ingrained in our nervous systems as trauma? Can we jumpstart ourselves into trust again? Uh, and can we instead um, like will ourselves to act as if we trust and rebuild the trust through action and through coming together rather, through, rather than through waiting for ourselves to heal from whatever. I'm banking on the action because I don't think we have capacity to do all the healing of everything that's happened. But when we come together, when we have shared purpose, if you build communities and the communities have something that binds them together that is bigger than just, we love the idea of being together, exactly creating, or not even creating, exposing our fundamental need of each other is, is for me part of the solution. Thank you. So much is so much is stimulated and 
there's a huge uh, yeah sense of what is not lost and how there is all this within our society in india and how do we engage with that from a space of uh, awareness of needs and i want to read out the last paragraph that you wrote mickey uh, to put my question after that that what i am envisioning as a path into a livable future is fully restoring and reinventing the commons and mobilizing our vast intelligence and creativity in service to finding ways of caring for ourselves as a species in ways that are interconnected and oriented towards needs and i love this statement that only in such a world would i ever want to be a child it's as if you are speaking on behalf of an unborn child mm -hmm. that brings up to me this inquiry that you know uh, when parents as parents we decide to have a child what needs are we expecting to fulfill mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. decision to have a child and could we include the needs of the children unborn um through us what would their needs be and then mm -hmm. maybe you know uh, mm -hmm. take the step because in india there are people who are saying we don't want children and there are some who are putting like a tick mark that okay i have a job i have a house full to have a child as a tick mark you know so the yeah. pandemic is bringing to us and your article also points out that somebody like we said that children can learn from older children and vice versa mm -hmm. so i want to ask you what would what conversation would help uh, to further that that need of an unborn child in a family yeah yes uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I, again, I don't know enough, but my intuitive sense is that there is a kind of like a social tension in a place like India, where there's a lot of pockets that are still completely community based, but that is beginning to be looked down on. It's like if you want you want to distance yourself from that and become more westernized more middle class more urban and and i've seen this in writing and in some conversations and i'm, I'm curious first of all if that matches your sense that there is some cultural drift in a westernizing direction there used to be but no no i think there is so much uh, um, uh, diverse thought and okay. action emerging so i'm very hopeful yes i am i am actually relieved to hear that we live in a, a, an in, interconnected environment as a, as a, in a slice of society on a daily basis mm -hmm. so yeah. that makes us be more stimulated and then look inwards mm -hmm. to what might be required so we are more agile to the requirements of the time okay yeah. uh so i'm i'm thinking about your question how do we as potential parents orient to the needs of our future children mm. and yes. um it is interesting because i think there are many needs of children that adults don't think about uh, years ago this was the last time that I did a school in training in nonviolent communication in a school. I decided it's not for me. I'm too identified with children. I was to, uh, having a workshop with the teachers and I asked them to name which are the needs that they think children bring with them to the school, that they see it as part of their job to care for. And they named all kinds of needs and was um, all very meaningful, but there was one need 
that they didn't name at all. And it was very telling for me. That was a need for choice. They didn't think part of their job to create the conditions within which children could have choice. The entire project of raising children is about taking away their freedom and giving it to them as a gift when they're 18. Yeah. And so if I was going to be a parent creating, thinking through children, having or not having children, which I did that when I was 17 and decided not to have children for any number of reasons, but that the personal thing is not quite the point. If I were reflecting on this, I would think about a larger question, which is what are the conditions necessary for whatever child might we might bring into the world to thrive? And if I were thinking about it like this, I would know right away that a nuclear family cannot produce these conditions. It just is impossible. The, what is needed is more than what uh, even two on one can give. And so I have been thinking in the last while that for as long as we are set up in this funny to some uh, configurations, maybe a step in the direction of the commons would be to create parenting pods yeah. where several configurations of adults, maybe some single, some in, in pairs, some in other configurations, whatever it is, like together decide that they together are going to have a child. Not each unit separately, but together they're going to have a child. They look at the totality of the resources and capacities that are available within their pod, and that makes the decision who are going to be the biological parents of that child. They don't even necessarily have to be a couple or in any way related to each other. It's just like, what makes sense biologically? Who, most especially, who has the capacity to be pregnant? That is the most significant thing. Who has the capacity to be pregnant, to, to be in proximity, in physical proximity with the child for the duration of breastfeeding? and construct a collective little life around that child, then I believe that there can be like an, an island of something that can work for the child. It also, if we did that on a mass scale, that would also be a solution to overpopulation. Yeah. It's a very gentle way to reduce our numbers gradually. And this works well in India also because our joint family system is alive. So I hear many, many couples or, um, you know, uh, yeah, couples saying that, you know, uh, we don't want a child of our own because my sister's child or my brother's child is as close to me or mm -hmm. can be as close to me as my own. Yeah. And they are very open to uh, any participation that we may have. Yeah. or want to have with their children because they know that we need we need each other you know yeah you know so that uh, is that is still a possibility uh, marshall rosenberg said fundamentally that human development works best when we develop both autonomy and interdependence so fundamentally that's what i would want to think through how do I create the conditions for my child, for our child, whatever, for the child that is around to develop both autonomy and interdependence so that freedom and relationship are intertwined as they used to be rather than one at the expense of the other. Yeah. 
And I love that you said that it's, I also say often that enough of survival, I choose to thrive. And then look at the needs, awareness, and say, what does thriving mean in the moment yeah. and henceforward? Thank you. So thank you. And because another thing, one last point very shortly is when children, parents who have one child also realize that they cannot meet the emotional needs of that child, they have a pet. And now the conversation is going to, of course, have a pet, but also have two children. Uh -huh. The two children and a pet brings, uh, brings a whole lot of wholesomeness, uh, sense of responsibility and uh, whole idea of life and death and everything. You know, it's a real, it's a, it's a complete world when you have a... Life. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I was really enjoying hearing this idea of parenting pods um, and collaboration and ways of kind of like being a parent without really being a parent in the traditional or sorry, mainstream mm -hmm. two parent model. And I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, what would be, what's your view on why is it that we don't see so much of that happening? What are the, what are the pressures that, I mean, I was surprised to read that over time, um, we even see less two parent households and more of a trend toward people living alone. Mm -hmm. What would it be that tilts us in that direction compared to toward more collaboration? All of this is conjecture. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't actually know it, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, um, and I, I've been in conversations recently. I think a twosome is a particularly um, uh, capacity consuming um, configuration. When you're on your own, um, it's hard, but in, in a way there is a retreat. You can retreat from stimulation, from conflict, from all kinds of things. You can retreat into your own sphere. When there are two of you, it seems like there will be more capacity, but any human configuration gets into conflict. And if there are two of you and the two of you are in conflict, you're doomed. If there's even a third person and two people are in conflict, the third person can help. If there are four people, there's already more flow of resources. There is a maximum. So what I have read in terms of evolution, we used, when we were foraging, the group that was most closely connected seems to have been five to eight people. I think five to eight adults, but I'm not, I'm not positive about that and I don't know where to look it up. But that is a configuration where you can see that even if there is, you know, like reduced capacity, either because of conflict or illness or whatever, there's going to be capacity elsewhere in that configuration. And that if it's bigger than that, the ties of trust and flow and intimacy and knowing each other and knowing who's good for what can kind of like dissipate. And so it becomes less optimal. But a twosome is a lot of stimulation and trigger without a lot of capacity to deal with it. So I, I can see why when the, the culture doesn't give us the option of more than two, and the two is too much, we will go to one. I'm, I'm wondering if that intuitively makes sense. Like I said, I don't know, but that's, that's what I'm thinking. Does, does that ring true for you? Yeah, me individually, I see myself as introverted. I, I kind of need space alone to recharge. So yeah, but still I'm curious about, so why, why is it that I don't just see more models out there, more examples of people doing this in uh, bigger numbers? Yeah, I think 
Um, one piece of it is that the normative structure still holds the two parents, one male, one female, with two point something children as the ideal. And that picture, the cultural picture, has a big impact on us. So people who are who want to do anything other than that have a you know first an internal struggle to overcome the imprint that that's the ideal and then when you overcome that struggle then there's everyone around you who looks at you like what are you doing uh, so it requires strength to do something that is different that's that's my sense of why it doesn't happen anything that requires individual capacity and strength and it's not systemically anchored it's going to happen less than what is systemically anchored and what is systemically anchored is that nuclear family even if it doesn't happen and where it doesn't happen it's pathologized yeah thanks I was particularly struck by um, how, in a way, both adults and, and children are caught in these rigid structures that are sort of counter to flow. Um, and questions coming up of to what, what to do in this situation. So if I look at my young, daughter um, growing up um, there's a fear about what she's growing up to and about my powerlessness to change our external situation so mm -hmm. it is even a one parent a separated uh, two parents and no community hardly any kind of really supportive community around and also um, as as what was spoken about earlier with Emma's question is that I, I see myself repeating what I was conditioned into. So it's not only my external situation yeah. that is so painful, but it's me seeing myself repeating how I was conditioned and just, yeah. Passing it on. Yes. And I seem to not be able to not do that. So the, the not falling into, into the despair and what came up was mm -hmm. that my only power that I have is to have trust. So to have trust in her, in her resilience and trusting that she won't be damaged or broken and to trust in life. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I often speak of mourning as a necessary ingredient of life, because there is truly a whole lot that you cannot change. And so mourning softens that it, it moves the despair from a kind of like a hardened edge that you resist to a soft place where you just sit with the reality that your power to change the conditions of her living and the conditions of your living is in, intrinsically limited as an individual. So, and part of what mourning does when we engage in it is on the other side of it, we often have more energy and more creativity. Um, I also want to share here a story that inspired me many years ago. I learned of a woman who very consciously decided to be a single mother, to bring she knew she wanted to have two children so to bring two children into the world as a single mother and what she did is she contracted i don't know how to say it it's not the right word but I, it's the one that's coming to with seven different friends each of them took one day of the week and they committed to these two children until they became 18 that they were going to be there with her and them on their day of the week and they st structured their life like this is the way that it went 
And I knew what I didn't know her very well, but I knew one of those people. It was a sacred commitment. It wasn't her child. It wasn't any sense of this is my child, but it was a very clear commitment that this is what I am doing. And the mother of the children also went to live in a co-housing community. So there was some co-housing communities are very weak. They don't have very strong bonds. I mean, some of them do, but that's accidental. They're not created with strong bonds. They're created um, out of values, but not out of a commitment to build life together. Um, but, but still, there are people around that you know in a smaller container. So there is something, especially for the children, with their children of others, and, and they grow up with that. But that sense of having people who take on the commitment to be part of a child's life and therefore also part of your life uh, was, was a very inspiring model, which doesn't mean that you necessarily can do it. It's not like a prescription. It's just, I think we need to hear stories because the stories that we hear give us an idea, oh, something is possible that I didn't think about. This one won't work for me, but maybe it will give me an idea for something else. The third thing that I want to say is that you can mourn with her. Even though you cannot not pass on to her what you are what passed on to what was passed on to you, you can tell her. Acknowledge. You can acknowledge to her, I'm passing on to you things that I wish I didn't. It's not what I want. I know it has impact on you. Maybe you, sometimes you don't even know the impact. I want you to know this is just the limit of my capacity. It's not how I want it to be. I can tell you if anyone told me this as a child, it would have made a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the older she gets, the more conversations you, you can have with her about the limitations of living as you do. I'm seeing that you're crying and that, that just shows me how much you care for her and want her to have all the conditions to thrive. And that you can convey to her even when your capacity is not up to it. Individually, you cannot change the, the societal conditions and that, that is part of the tragedy that we're talking about here. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. What comes up is this idea of, of mourning and maybe something that is similar to mourning, which is if we can't change anything, then at least we can be present with the situation. And I don't know, it's an intuitive thing, but it seems that yeah. that does something. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Similar to children, the elderly, um, I, I was thinking of them when I was reading your article in the sense that uh, not much autonomy and closed and um, maybe outsourced even. Yeah. yeah. So if you... I, um, I've thought, I, am, I am feeling I didn't think to include this in this article in some way. Um, I can say that the tragedy of elders in our culture is that the traditional role of elders, which is the culture weavers, the people who share the stories, um, is often clipped and, um, and distorted. And I have been thinking for decades now of how sad it is that we have so many parents who are struggling to have enough care for their children and so many elders who have nothing meaningful in their life and how simple it would be to connect the elders with the children and it would be rich for everyone, uh, you know, kind of like win, win, win. And yet our society doesn't do that. And the elders are some of the people who have most uh, suffered uh, within the pandemic because during lockdown, their isolation, which is often already extreme, 
um, they couldn't get visits either at home or in if they're in a care home. So it's it's it really accentuated how much elders are kind of like become throwaway people. We don't need you anymore because the the capacity to end our lives by being in service to younger generations is no longer held with uh, care and respect. So that's that's what I uh, what I have to say about this, and I appreciate that you brought this into the mix.